The first talk tonight will be given ab uh, about the uh, prize in physiology or medicine. Uh, Salil Lachki is going to be the speaker. Salil earned a PhD in biology from the University of Iowa, where he actually had the opportunity to meet one of the prize winners, John Gurdon, who influenced his decision to pursue research in developmental biology. Salil did postdoctoral work at Harvard and took a position as instructor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School before joining the University of Delaware in 2011, where he is now an assistant professor in our Department of Biological Sciences. Salil's research focuses on identification of genes that are associated with eye development and disease, and the work of the, this prize has been very influential on him. So Salil, please come on stage. Can, can everybody hear me? Is the mic on? All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dorian, for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, it's a distinct pleasure, really, to be able to uh, introduce this uh, Nobel Prize winning research uh, in physiology or medicine in the year of 2012. Uh, this year, it was given to two distinguished scientists, uh, uh, Sir John B. Gurdon and Dr. Uh, Shinya uh, Yamanaka. And uh, Dr. Gurdon uh, is affiliated with the Gurdon Institute uh, uh, in Cambridge in the United Kingdom, while Dr. Yamanaka holds two affiliations, uh, one in Kyoto University in Japan and the other in the Gladstone Institute uh, here in the United States. The fact that uh, Dr. Gurdon is knighted, he's Sir John Gurdon, and uh, he holds an, an entire institute is named after him in Cambridge, uh, indicates that uh, his work has already been well established and recognized in the field. Okay. And here are the two Nobel Prize winners. So they won this prize for their uh, contribution uh, in, uh, for the discovery that mature cells in our body can be reprogrammed into what are called as pluripotent cells, something like embryonic stem cells. What do we mean by pluripotent cells? Pluripotent cells are cells that can form essentially any kind of cell in our body. Okay, and uh, this is a fundamental discovery, as I think we will all uh, uh, appreciate by the end of this talk. Uh, but one thing that one should remember, and I keep reminding this to myself in my research, is that if you look at the uh, string of Nobel laureates in physiology or medicine over the last uh, several decades, uh, and you can distill their research to just simple questions, you'll realize that the questions that they asked were surprisingly clear, surprisingly straightforward. And it always uh, you know, reminds one that, why didn't I think of this before, really? Okay. And some of these examples are very simple, as they can be distilled into these uh, sentences. Is there a genetic program for cell death? How do proteins find their way inside the cell? Uh, how can cells make antibodies against really any kind of pathogen that challenges our body? or our own uh, Daniel Nathans, who graduated from the University of Delaware and went on to win the Nobel in 1979 for his discovery that uh, really there are enzymes uh, which can specifically digest DNA. And none of the molecular biology uh, revolution uh, that uh, allows us to do the experiments that we do right now would have been possible without these discoveries. But again, ultimately they are distilled to some very simple fundamental question. So what was Dr. Gurdon and Dr. Yamanaka's question? And uh, for that, we have to appreciate how really we form uh, from a single cell. Okay? And our body is really made up of 100 trillion cells uh, and of or around over 200 different cell types. Okay? So this is a complex, really, machine. And it all finds its origin in just one fertilized a cell, the fertilized egg. Okay. So how is this possible? This is possible because there is a nucleus in the cell which can actually, which has the hereditary material which is called DNA and this particular nucleus uh, has all the information for a developmental program that allows this one cell to begin uh, development into the kind of uh, organism that we become. Okay, so very early during development, uh, there is a stage where this one cell divides into a number of cells 
which are called as embryonic stem cells. And I'm sure you have all heard about embryonic stem cells uh, uh, within the last decade or so because they have been really uh, the talk of the nation uh, several times. Okay. So the reason they are important is because these embryonic stem cells can, uh, they are pluripotent and they can form any different kind of cell. Shown in this picture is this diagram of an embryonic stem cell which can actually form all the different kinds of cells in our bodies like muscle cells, brain cells like neurons, uh, heart cells and so forth. So that's uh, sort of known. Embryonic stem cells can form these cells. What was not known was that can these different kinds of cells which we call as mature cells, whether they can be converted into back into embryonic stem cells or something like embryonic stem cells. Okay, that's a very fundamental question. So the question that was asked by Dr. Gurdon and Dr. Yamanaka was that can mature cells be converted into pluripotent stem cells? And again, I remind everyone, pluripotent just means that these cells can form any different kinds of cell in our body. Okay. So let's look at what Dr. Gurdon did. And he carried out his experiments uh, really almost uh, 56 years ago, I guess 56 years ago now, uh, and uh, uh, in the late 50s. And we have to remind ourselves what it was like really uh, when he started these experiments. Uh, we had just learned the structure of the DNA. Batson and Crick had just uh, you know, given us the structure of the DNA. We had really not an idea about the genetic code that had yet to be solved. Uh, we really had not put together all the biochemistry that, that goes on in our cells. Uh, we didn't know how many genes we had in our body and so forth. So this was really essentially a very, very early time uh, in molecular biology. And Dr. Gurdon used uh, the techniques at that time uh, and improvised on them and really uh, performed some simple experiment which had profound implications. So the question he asked, was could he take the nucleus uh, of a differentiated cell, for simplicity we'll call it as mature cells, okay? Could he take that nucleus which had undergone all the developmental changes and had now formed a certain kind of cell? Could he take that nucleus and could he put it into the nucleus of an undifferentiated cell uh, like the egg, okay? So he removed the nucleus of the egg in frogs, he did these experiments in frogs, he put this nucleus of the differentiated cell in that egg and he asked the question whether this modified cell now could form different kinds of cells. Okay, so in other words, whether this mature cell nucleus could drive development. Okay, and uh, a beautiful result was found. That was that when he did these experiments, uh, these cells, so he took the cell from this intestinal cell, uh, I mean the nucleus from this intestinal cell, and he put it in this egg which had, uh, now he had removed this nucleus, and this cell could differentiate into tadpoles and in many cases whole frogs. So this was the first basic really uh, uh, discovery which showed that the differentiated cell nucleus does harbor all the information that can potentially uh, drive all the cells in the body, can make all the cells in the body, if used in the right context. It also uh, really uh, uh, was significant because uh, it also showed that the egg also had all the factors that were necessary to reprogram this nucleus, the mature cell nucleus, into something like a stem cell nucleus, okay? And of course, as we know, for the last 15 years or so, there have been several uh, really mammals where, which have been cloned, the famous uh, sheep dolly uh, and uh, pigs and cows and so forth. Okay, so this result found by Dr. John Gurdon in 1958 was really fundamental for all of this to really take place. Dr. Gurdon published his work in 1962 in this relatively lesser known journal uh, it's not a nature or a science paper uh, you know, or a cell paper, which are some of the most prestigious journals that uh, biomedical researchers publish in. This is an important journal, but yet not as generally accepted 
uh, as some of these others. It's the Journal of Embryonic and uh, Experimental Morphology. Okay. The date is significant too. He had to wait four years before he could publish it because some folks didn't believe this was possible. And in other cases, he had to wait until he showed that there were entire frogs that were formed from this procedure. So he had to really wait until that happened. But this date is also significant because this was the year that uh, Yamanaka was born. Okay. And this I've mentioned because it goes on to show that how science can be a lengthy process or sometimes how something fundamental, the person who discovers this fundamental discovery has to wait until sort of uh, the world catches up around them and realizes how significant it is. But Yamanaka uh, quickly realized when he became a career scientist that uh, this was an important result and he wanted to pursue in his own lab uh, the biology of embryonic stem cells and pluripotent cells. So, Dr. Yamanaka actually also asked a very profound question. Let's fast forward to 2006. Okay, now this is the age we have sequenced our genome. The several mammalian genomes are sequenced. We know every base pair in the genome. Okay, we know that there is a genetic code. We know about the biochemistry of our cells. We know how genes interact with each other to form entire organisms. Okay, so with all this wealth of an information, it's still a complex field, of course. But Dr. Yamanaka asked a surprisingly clear and simple question. And that was, from the 20, 25,000 genes in our body, could he just find a subset, a few, that could reprogram a cell to form a pluripotent stem cell? Okay. And uh, he actually asked, if you notice the slight difference in his approach versus Dr. Gurdon's approach 50 years ago, is that he wanted to convert this one cell, its nucleus and everything in it, to, an embryo, uh, to a pluripotent stem cell. He didn't want to take out the nucleus and put it in some other cell and all. He, he took this cell and he said, could we make this cell into a pluripotent stem cell? Okay, that's the beauty of his simplicity of his question. Dr. Yamanaka is a trained physician, a surgeon actually, and he also is a trained basic biologist. And it goes on to show how uh, a clinical and a bi uh, biological uh, training helped him in his research. Okay. And what he did was, uh, he also used one important result that he found. Uh, this was published in 1995 on the cover of Science. And what this result shows is that one gene, just a single gene, PAC6, which is conserved from flies to humans. This gene, if you make, misexpress this gene, in the region which the fly forms an antenna, it forms an eye right here. Okay. So misexpression of this gene, and this is incidentally a human a counterpart of PAC6, which was misexpressed in this fly, and it, found, or it formed a fly eye. So Yamanaka took the conclusion to indicate that there were genes in our body which could actually reprogram cells. Okay, there were single genes that could reprogram cells. So then he asked the question that uh, could he find a subset of genes which could reprogram differentiated or mature cells into stem-like cells. So we, we, without going into all the details that he did, I would like to tell you his Really, the best, uh, the, the, the profoundness of his discovery was that he took a skin cell from a mouse, he introduced just four factors, and of course, that's where the, uh, the, the details is where really it is crucial, but he managed to find four factors from 25,000 genes in our body, uh, and he introduced these four factors, and he realized that these cells, uh, the skin cells, could now be turned into pluripotent stem cells. And he called them, to differentiate them from embryonic stem cells, he called them induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs, okay? And he showed that you could actually make an entire mouse using these cells, okay? So this is an important, a very fundamental discovery uh, uh, of the ages that we live in, uh, that he could go down to the molecular details and show us uh, uh, really uh, how this reprogramming of cells occur. Uh, this paper was published in Cell, uh, which is one of the best journals that one could hope to publish in, in 2006. And I still remember to this day that when I first saw this paper in 2006, I was a postdoc at Harvard, and we immediately realized that we wanted to do a journal club on this one, on that week itself. 
There are few times in one's career that you read a paper and you know that this is going to win a Nobel Prize. And this was one of those papers that I distinctly remember in my career. Okay. Uh, Dr. Uh, Takahashi is, I, I believe, Dr. Yamanaka's postdoc who carried out some of this work. And I thought it is prudent to mention his contribution to the field uh, when we uh, discuss about this research. So how is this beneficial to us in the end? And this is where it becomes really interesting because uh, the, one of the points that I want to drive home today is that we sometimes think of basic research as something that scientists do in their lab and which may never reach the bench, uh, so to speak, the bench side, that is the clinical side of aspects. But this particular research uh, proves this theory wrong. It shows that something fundamental that you can learn about yourself can actually quickly be uh, translated into the clinic. And one of the quick sort of uh, really applications of this that one can think about, although it's not a reality yet, but one can now start seeing that it can be a reality in the next few years, is that since we can take this cells, a skin cell or any cell from our own body, we don't really need to depend on embryonic stem cells anymore. We can take cells from our own skin or so forth, and we can introduce these Yamanaka factors, which are these four factors, and we can make these cells into what are called as induced pluripotent stem cells. And now, if we learn enough about how these cells can be channeled into specific cell fates, uh, say cells of the eye, uh, or neurons, or uh, you know, cardiomyocytes, which are cells of the heart, or so forth, then we can engineer these uh, stem, induced pluripotent stem cells to form these specific kinds of cells. And of course, if we can do this fundamental step, then we can actually start thinking about assembling whole tissues and organs uh, uh, out of this technique. That's one fundamental application. The other one is that, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the, uh, 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 we see that there are genetic disorders uh, in, in the human population, but we cannot study humans. Uh, really. But this allows us to actually take their cells where there is a genetic change, make induced pluripotent stem cells, and then see the disease occur in a petri dish. So this allows us for the first time to study human disease directly uh, during a developmental sort of, uh, uh, you know, cascade. Okay. And now there are pharmaceutical companies and such uh, who are thinking about using these cells, which are uh, cells uh, from patients, uh, to see how these cells can respond to therapeutic in interventions. So together, Dr. Gurdon and Dr. Yamanaka's work has really opened up the field of uh, regenerative medicine. And uh, I think it's an uh, extremely promising uh, really field to be working in right now. So I included this slide uh, to show that these scientists are also capable of having some fun in their lives when they're not doing these groundbreaking researches. Uh, here, Dr. Yamanaka is seen uh, you know, resting after a game of rugby. Uh, I would not have thought that he will play rugby after looking at his portrait. Uh, and uh, you know, I had the distinct pleasure to meet Dr. Gurdon when I was a graduate student in Iowa. Uh, he was an extremely kind gentleman that I remember uh, who took great interest in uh, research of a graduate student like myself, and it really did influence my uh, really decision to fo uh, follow developmental biology in my own research career. However, I never pictured him uh, really like this, uh, but whatever they're doing, it seems like it is, they're having fun. So they're really, that's what I wanted to portray from this slide. And the last thing I want to leave you guys with is that uh, this is a note that Dr. Gurdon actually has volunteered for everybody else to see. And without reading the entire note, it actually suggests that Dr. Gurdon has aspirations of becoming a scientist, but probably won't make it if he does that, uh, because, uh, and I will just read this one line to you, is that because he will not listen, but will insist on doing his work in his own way. And I think today, as a community, we should really be thankful that Dr. Gurdon actually was not discouraged by such notes and really you know, did his work in his own way. Thank you very much.